Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode on Space Still Live. It's very nice to have you if you're joining us on YouTube. Welcome if you're on Facebook, thanks for joining us. Uh, welcome to Rianne, uh, thanks for joining us, Ground Based Space. Hey, how are you? Uh, good, you're all looking forward to tonight's talk, so am I. Because tonight on the show, we've got Helen McGee. Hey Helen, how are you? Hi, I'm good, thank you. Very awesome. well. Awesome. So great to have you. Now, for those of you who don't know, Helen is a senior lecturer, senior lecturer in photography at the University of Sunderland. And tonight's talk is about another dimension. We're going to be going on a dark sky experience with Helen. Um, so I'm really excited, looking forward to this. Um, Helen, maybe if you want to tell, tell everyone a little bit um, about what you do at the University of Sunderland. Um, yes, um, so I am I teach photography at Sunderland, um, but I'm also studying my PhD there and have been for about five years, um, which seems to have flown by. Um, and, uh, and what I've been doing uh, recently is working with uh, Kielder Observatory up in Northumberland, um, and uh, which is in the Europe's largest gold tier um, dark sky park. Um, and they uh, to find new creative encounters with with dark skies so I can I'll be sharing some slides and show you a bit more about that shortly. Awesome awesome I think everyone's looking forward to this so without further ado I'll hand it over to you and take it away. Thank you. Hopefully that's come up okay at your end. Um, so yes, um, my project is called Another Dimension um, and I'm gonna be giving you a bit of um, photographic color, I suppose, about what it is that I do um, before I talk to you about what Another Dimension is because it's one part of the PhD project that I've been doing. Um, but thank you very much, first of all, just to say thanks to Space Store for having me. Um, it's great to be sharing my research um, uh, with 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 you lot who are watching, so thank you. Um, so since 2017, I've been working with the observatory up in Kielder, um, exploring new creative encounters um, in Northern England specifically. So I'm using photography, film, and um, sound um, made from photographs, actually, which I will share with you shortly, um, to sort of share um, new encounters with outer space, uh, basically. But essentially, my work is all about darkness. Um, I'm a photographer, and I've spent many a, an hour, many a day, actually, in the dark room. So that was really my first link uh, with thinking about astronomy and space spending time in in dark spaces making images looking and observing into my own kind of creative um pr practice um so really i'm sort of i've that's where the impetus started really for, for this uh, project and um thinking about the links between um the photographic dark room and the observatory um in an astronomical uh, term um so and this is part of an AHRC funded PhD project um, developed in partnership with Kielder Observatory. So part of the research is um, not only for my own um, uh, sort of field in photography, not to just to contribute to my field, but also to contribute to um, Kielder Observatory um, as a, um, a dark sky um, business essentially in Northumberland and um, a science communication charity and organization so um, and just to say about the building you can see here this is a picture of Kielder Observatory it's um, um, it's it's a what was described to me as a transgressive observatory which I just think is a wonderful word for it because it's it's square it's shaped to look like an, a ship emerging at the top of a landscape um, rather than a traditional kind of dome structure. So um, it's actually when it was um, when it was funded and uh, proposed, um, it was actually uh, it, it, it was funded as part and, and made as part of the Kielder Art and Architecture Trail. Um, but then and it was only supposed to have, uh, I think, seven events a year. But through the, the kind of process of, uh, you know, astronomers getting in and the public getting in and, and, and you know, and getting excited about dark skies, it, there, there's now many, many events every year. Um, there's at least one every evening. Um, so that's what it's all about, really. And I think what, what I'm trying to do is, is um, use my creativity to sort of um, bring that to the observatory and in a different way. 
So I just wanted to start with this quote, which is actually a screenshot from another dimension. And this is by John Wheeler, who's a, um, who was an American the theoretical physicist who coined the term black holes. Um, but I just love this idea of how the universe would be nothing without observers. You know, it's a cultural thing. You know, it's it's only the universe because we say, you know, essentially is a, in, in a language because we deem it to be called universe. You know, if we weren't here with a language, it wouldn't necessarily have a name. Um, you know, it would be matter. Um, and, you know, despite of us, in spite, you know, it doesn't matter whether we're there or not. So but I, I so I like the idea of observers almost deciding what space is and what space looks like. Um, so. Um, Photography, you know, for me, it, it what it does is it helps us try to understand the universe. So this is um, a very early picture. Um, this is the uh, first clear uh, image of the moon by John William Draper from 1840. Um, and what you know, he was actually a physicist and a chemist. Um, so he, like many astronomers, um, oh sorry, like many uh, photographers, there was a, often a scientific background there. Um, and it was almost like trying to find, um, use uh, the camera and telescopes together to create almost like a, a what was deemed mechanical objectivity. So seeing some sort of truth through through the lens. But it's not it's not always um, as clear cut as that. And, you know, we we all decide how we want to picture things, as I will show you. So uh, there is a lot of human intent in the work um, in, in images. Uh, and uh, I'm quite skeptical of truth in, in photography. So uh, I suppose I'm poking at that with my own work. Um, so, uh, you know, and some of the other early images that you would see, um, you know, these were, were, were to do with technical capabilities of exposure time and things like that. Um, so, so this is some work by um, James Nasbeth and James Carpenter. Um, you, some of you might recognize it. It's actually um, some photographs that were in a book um, about ge geology, lunar geology, called the Moon considered as a planet, a world, and a satellite. And it, this is actually available to download online because it's out of copyright, and it's just a beautiful publication. And these images look like wonderful um, photographs of, of uh, close-ups of the Moon. But as you can see from the the, the plaster model um, on the, the side of the screen, it's actually was something that was sculpted through, um, you know, carefully cr cr careful craftsmanship. There was lots of looking through the, the the lens and through the telescope, trying to find the detail and then just to sculpt it. And then what they did is they put it in the sun and had that the shadows that almost looked um, like a real a real surface. So, you know, again, truth and fiction is really kind of relevant within photography, you know, and of course, you know, technology's changed. You know, we obviously this is uh, the Hubble telescope and the uh, James Webb. Um, and what these are, uh, uh, you know, uh, making the point that um, I just wanted to make the point that now as, as humans we are you know we we know that looking through the atmosphere from earth actually creates wobbly images perhaps or blur it's not clear necessarily so we we have to get beyond earth and look from elsewhere um and i just think it's quite interesting how you know we we deem that that to understand is to see um or to see is to understand um and how we we go to these big kind of um huge expensive efforts to to find out um so it's quite it's quite interesting in that um and of course hubble you know are very famous um photographs and culturally they're very interesting because um for me as an artist um because often they're deemed i mean someone a, a um a, an author describes them uh, anya ventura describes them um as pretty pictures and um she says uh, quote to acknowledge the human made aspects of the deep space picture the inevitable acts of individual conjecture and mediation involved in its creation is thus to acknowledge the limits of human knowledge and perception. So for me, it's all about kind of almost the image is about um, uh, acknowledging that images are pretty, uh, perhaps, or beautiful or aesthetically um, nice to look at, almost acknowledges that we're building them for us. And it's not necessarily, you know, it's for our purpose to look at them. Um, and, you know, in a lot of research, actually, um, images that are um, seen as uh, uh, colourful um, are perhaps not actually useful to scientists. It's more for a, a kind of public marketing exercise that, that for the audience to look at and be wowed, which, of course, we are. And of course, I am and always have been. But 
it's interesting to sort of unpick. Um, but, you know, within that, with this kind of use, uh, what, what often happens with Hubble images, um, or what has happened, is images are processed. Um, so, you know, there's data that you can actually download from online um, and you can you can process them and you can change the colors and you can, you, you know, you would do this. You would use false colors to sort of show different elements. So here we've got the Crab Nebula, two images, but the same object, essentially. And they look totally different because of the colors that are used. And what it, what is happening here is that scientists, um, you know, um, are, are using uh, color to sort of demonstrate um false um uh, use false color to to show things that we can't see so there might be um you know the visible spectrum is only very small and um they're trying to illustrate essentially and show the human eye what is on what we are unable to see um with the human eye with this color so for example you know quite often and i've spoken to to people who observe you know who might not know um like at Kilo, for example when i've, I've been there and spoken to, to guests you know, they might sort of feel like, you know, a bit unsure about why the sky doesn't look like it does in pictures, you know, and it's because actually there's a lot of processing and, you know, even a long exposure in a camera will deem an, a different results and show a different representation of the sky than what our human eye sees. So, you know, and just to sort of demonstrate this, this is a, a screenshot from this um, cool website called wikisky.org. And uh, this is an astrophotography um, sort of survey. And uh, you can actually search and find different sky, deep sky objects that have been processed. Um, and this is one area of sky. But you can see there's like a, almost like a patchwork of different images that have been processed by different people. And there's blues, there's pinks, there's reds, there's yellows. But it's all mapped together. So it's one area. And for me, it just reveals the human intention to show something and to, you know, that kind of, um, that representation of the sky that is, uh, you know, has has a, a an intent. Um, so I'm I'm quite intrigued by that. And culturally, you know, someone like um, this is Dave Watson's image, who was at Royal Photography Society Science Photographer of the Year in 2019. You know, this is an image that was taken from Earth, but you know, it has that kind of processing and that colourful aesthetic that, in a way, has a nod towards the, the Hubble images. So culturally, they're in space. Um, it, it's in, it's in sort of on the internet. You know, they're, they're you know in coffee table books. We see these amazing images of Hubble, and then we start to believe maybe that's what space looks like. But it, it's a it's a human kind of perception of, of space. So I'm interested in kind of unpicking that a little bit. Um, and just to say as well, um, obviously this is the, the Pillars of Creation, a very famous uh, NASA image from 95. Um, and um, Elizabeth Kessler, who's a, um, sort of a cultural theorist, talks about the idea of the um, astronomical sublime um, and how actually um, images of Hubble uh, almost borrow from um, painterly uh, representations of the American West, which, you know, like you can see with Albert Bierce, that's uh, image here, uh, painting here. Um, you know, they use those kind of sense of awe and wonder and terror and fear of these environments, um, which is almost like culturally evoked it onto space. So, um, but for me, I'm interested in people. You know, I'm interested in what Eugene Auger is interested in here in, in, um, in 1912, uh, in this image called Pendant Eclipse. And it's of a, um, an eclipse, a solar eclipse in Paris. He was, a, he, he photographed street images um, and, you know, in scenes. Um, and what he's done here is rather than looking at the sky and the astronomical event itself, he is interested in the people and in their experience of looking up. And you can see them gazing through sort of uh, lenses to protect their eyes. But I just think it's a really beautiful moment captured of uh, evoking wonder with space rather than trying to reveal space itself. It's about that almost that um, that wondrous nature of looking and gazing at the cosmos. Um, and of course, you know, there's images um, like some of the NASA photographs from the, the moon landing, which are of people as well, which have a kind of recognizable quality to them, both culturally from the news and from stories, but also in the way that they've been photographed. They look a bit like snapshots, you know, the image of Buzz Aldrin on the left here, you know, it's almost like a photograph of a family member captured at an, an exciting event. 
and uh, you know in the on on the one on the right you can see the shadow of the photographer which again is not dissimilar from somebody who might be photographing family members on a beach for example so there's something very familiar and very human about these images in some way um not to say that of course family photographs and snapshots don't have their own cultural kind of resonance and language but i just think they're there's something more human about them that's really, really interesting. Um, and I just wanted to show this as well that I've acquired during my research, which is actually um, a scan of the brief uh, for the architecture of the building at Kielder um, from 2005. Um, and Peter Sharp, um, the uh, Kielder Art, Art and Architecture curator, um, told me, you told me about how when he went to um see there was an exhibition of the moon photographs um, many years ago and he um he wanted to use that aesthetic of the nasa photographs so um to um from the mission um so to to have a sense of another world another dimension to um this land that could have potential of showing and having a housing and observatory so you can see the little crosses on the landscape um, and the kind of tonality of how the image, um, you know, shows the land it really connects and and uh, mirrors what was going on uh, in the moon picture. So for me, an it, Kilder has an element of another world, another planet, another dimension, and and something in a magical way and in a way to be explored, and has it by me as an artist basically. So and by visitors who 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 attend there every evening. So where do i fit with this as an artist you know art and science that they you know there's lots of connections but there's also they can be frictions sometimes um and um you know and it's something that i've been you know it, the journey of uh, producing images is, has been very key to the project so stage one of the the phd has been making it's been photographing talking to people and responding to the observatory so here is a, a photograph of me a few years ago. And actually, even though I was taking a test photo with a, um, a digital camera here, that the image on the tripod that I photographed um, uh, with was a Hasselblad, which is actually uh, the same type of camera that was used on the moon. Um, so it's quite interesting that those connections, but I basically spent a lot of time um, in the uh, in, in Kielda. Um, probably should have said at the beginning but I'm not from the northeast I'm from the northwest and I live um, in Manchester so um, it, there's a kind of sense of a, an ex, ex, exploration or a journey in terms of going to this place and you can see here that I stayed in this snooze pod at the bottom which I did just before about a week yeah, well about a month before the pandemic so I stayed in this um, this place uh, which was up by the observatory um, engaging in um, the feeling of being in a dark sky park for an extended period of time, which was was really wonderful. So my first piece of work is called Wanderers. Um, and um, there's two images here. And, and basically they're, they're of two people looking at the sky. But the sky, as you can see, is not starry. It hasn't got extended um, exposures with lots of, you know, detail. You know, there's fog actually in the one on the left and it's sort of twilight on, in the one on the right. And for me, I was trying to show this sense of wonder and anticipation of looking and waiting for the cosmos um, and almost creating a, a, a way of showing that you don't have to see the stars for them to be there. You know, it's about us and what's inside us. You know, we are made of stars, as it was said in a famous song. And, you know, there is that kind of feeling of, um, you know, we are we are on Earth, which is part of the solar system, which is part of the universe. You know, essentially, we're already exploring outer space. And I think that it's important to, to recognize the value of, of you know, uh, you know, looking at our own identities and our own world rather than always looking beyond and seeking to look beyond. So, I mean, I've called these wanderers because it was it, for a couple of reasons. One, because um, the ancient Greeks um, referred, uh, the word planet is derived from the ancient Greek name planetes, which means a traveler or a wanderer. And it feels relevant in terms of how I'm sort of, uh, my experience of looking as an artist and how I'm wandering perhaps beyond the, the norm of what might be shown through astrophotography, for example. Um, I'm straying beyond that path. And, and for me, that's, that's why it's relevant. Um, and uh, and then also another methodology that I used was to actually talk to um, people 
um, and to, to reflect on my own experiences of dwelling in dark places. So here I've got images that relate to the observatory or to conversations, you know, having a hot flask of tea on a cold night and looking up at the sky is important. Having a notebook where you can jot down ideas and things that you want to see or things that you have seen, you know, so I was quite intrigued in that. Um, this might look like something to you guys. Um, you might want to put in the chat, although I can't see the chat <laughs> because of the way I've got my computer set up. But um, it looks a bit like another planet, perhaps. And it's actually a car park, just to unpick that myth uh, immediately. And the reason and what I've called this is dark adaptation. And it's a car park um, near the at the bottom of the track where guests wait to ascend a long track up to the observatory at Kielder. And I've photographed it under, under um, red light, which is the same kind of safe light used for astronomers to um, to observe um, safely and have no nocturnal vision to, you know, to be able to see the sky. But it also has a kind of photographic darkroom connection. So th that's some of the early work. And then it's about how have I shared this knowledge? How have I shared these ideas, which has kind of been the later thing? So this is actually an image in the background from last week because I spent most of the week up at the observatory um, with my uh, I've got some sound um, that I was putting into the landscape to transform the experience of encounter for the, the viewers so um, sharing work and um, one of the first things that I did was observe experiment archive which was an exhibition organized by the Northeast Photography Network and this was um, 2019 to early uh, uh, November 2019 to January 2020. And it was all about um, how um, photographic artists um, explore science and reflect on science through photography. And, you know, there was filmmaking, all sorts of different kind of uh, representations in my area, including from backgrounds in sort of health and well-being as well. But mine had the, the space element to it. So, you know, this was a very traditional kind of, a, it was a museum space and, you know, I use that kind of aesthetic. So, you know, I had a large diorama-like image of the sky. I had also um, a table and um, that you can see with objects, um, with images and my wanderer portraits. And uh, this installation kind of shows um, almost this sort of museum touch table of an identity of perhaps what an astronomer is in the north of England, um, based on these conversations and reflections. So, again, things like uh, proper shoes, warm clothes, um, compass, that kind of thing. Another thing that I've done is I've thought about how my work fits within other sites. So last year I showed my work as part of a group exhibition called Selfscaped at Dolby Forest, which is another um, forestry England managed forest um, in the UK. And this, uh, which is also a dark sky discovery site, so it has a, a link with astronomy. And what I was trying to do was to create images that were almost like an accidental encounter for the audience who may happen to walk across them and, you know, see these these figures in the landscapes and maybe wonder what was going on. Um, and so, so that's and this is something that I'm hoping and planning to do um, in Kielda later on this year. So watch this space for more information. Excuse the pun. Um, which leads me to what I'm doing now um, and the whole kind of um, subject around this talk, which is another dimension. So um, as part of the project, it's, it's been really important to locate the work that I've done, not only outside of Kielder Observatory, but then putting it back into it. So I've made a online um, virtual encounter with dark skies. Um, and you can actually find this on the website. And it was important for me that this was hosted on the website itself so that the arts was embedded within this environment. And it almost took an audience um, who you know, might be looking to learn about space because it is a, a wonderful science communication organization. So learn about space or book a trip, um, that kind of thing, you know, but the observe, you know, what I wanted to show was almost like a curveball or, a, you know, a transformation. So I've actually got a QR code here and um, I made a series of posters um, that, that I actually shared at the observatory last week. So I'm going to take us into another dimension uh, in a second. But if anybody wants to explore the place on your phones um, or on another brow on your browser, feel free to um, capture the uh, QR code now. 
Um, so I'm going to just take you there. Oh, I love it when it does that with Zoom because it makes me into a portal, which feels quite relevant for what I'm doing. So I am, I'm going to, I've got it, la I've got it large uh, on another screen here. So I'm just going to take you in and you will hear some rather interesting sounds, which I will tell you about in a, in a moment. Large screen. So this is a, an in, the environment at Kielder, and what I've done is I've actually mapped the space in um, in augmented reality, and then I've put things into it like um, elements of video, of, of photography, of sound. It works um, to kind of engage, and it might be a little bit glitchy, but if it is, do feel free to explore um, the environment, but. Um, Kilda Observatory um, is at Kilda is part is in Kilda Forest, um, where there's also a Kilda Reservoir, which is quite um, a famous um, uh, man-made uh, reservoir. So that's what that shot was from. Keep picking the videos, which is probably not very wise because it'll take longer. This is actually part of um, James Terrell's um, Sky Space, um, which is a, uh, an, a part of the Art and Architecture Trail, um, not far from the observatory. So I was kind of thinking about how it links. Um, but there's all sorts of things like I've used text from um, uh, astronomers and from um, volunteers at the observatory. Um, there are pictures as well and find a picture for you okay go you've got my dark adaptation so this this is kind of like you know portals within portals so the images are almost portals um i won't show you another video because it will take time so this kind of curious things and what there is you know there's lots to explore um but there's in the top corner you'll see that there's um a an area where you can look at other spaces so this is one of the the telescope turrets and you can explore around the environment and then again you can just highlight these hot spots um and what i've tried to do is include information actually about um from the observatory as well um i can't find any of them now but uh things that um give information here's one where you know, uh, I tried to embed it with Kielder Observatory itself, so it's using art to kind of reconnect th with the business as well. Um, so there's lots, of, and you'll. So I promised I'd mentioned um, I'd mentioned the sound. Um, the sound is actually um, may sound slightly strange to you. Just thought I'd like that play. Um, what the sound actually is, is, um, <coughs> excuse me, is um, um, photographs that I've um, sonified. So I've put the images through um, a bit of software, which has actually transfer transformed them from vision into sound. And I don't know if anybody's heard some of the NASA um, sounds of space, space where they turn um, data into um, sound. What It has this kind of weird ghostly feel. So I've tried to kind of create an immersive experience of dark skies. And what I was doing last week at the observatory was I was actually putting some of this sound into the environment itself to, um, to give people almost like a heightened experience of um, feeling like they were in, in space when they got to the observatory. Um, so I won't go around everything because I, I've just realized the time, but I, you know, there's lots in it. There's lots to explore um you know that again it embeds it within the website as well um but there's lots and lots of images and sat and video and sound to hear um what i will just do is i will just take you to the final space so you can have a quick look at it i think it's a little bit glitchy 
name. But, you know, essentially what I've tried to do is almost create, um, and this is a very uh, sort of an important image as well, just to say it's one of the first ones that I took and it's kind of set the stage for what the project was. Um, and also, the, you know, the interesting thing about when I mapped the space with VR, um, with augmented reality, sorry, um, me and my partner were in uh, the forest. Oh, just turn that down. We we're in the forest and actually we got lost. <laughs> so, you know, there's this kind of weird disorientation of producing the work, um, which for me was quite interesting in terms of, you know, how an audience might feel when they're in space. Oh, sorry, how an astronaut might feel when they're in space. So, and this is the kind of classroom space of the observatory. So for me, it's, you know, really having that sense of like education as part of the environment. So I'll stop sharing. I'll just, uh, I'll turn the sound off. <laughs> I kind of like it. it. Sounds a bit bonkers. Um, I quite like it. So um, what I will just do is I will finish there. Um, thanks for listening and thanks for um, having a look at my work. I hope it came through to you okay at your end. Um, here's my social media um, handle. So do follow me because there's going to be some more stuff going on this year. Um, and it would be lovely to, you know, to hear any feedback you've got about the, the work because it's all really relevant for evaluating my PhD um, and just learning and thinking about moving forward. So um, feel free to get in touch. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Helen, for a lovely presentation. I've got to say that was so cool. Um, the sounds were a little bit creepy, but it was just like, it was so cool. Well, how you've done that. So you actually went out and formed the kind of whole structure of that AR, VR stuff yourself. Yeah. I, I used software that was actually, it's kind of used in a lot of uh, selling houses, real estate. Yes, but... yes. Um, and uh, what I noticed is during the pandemic is a lot of galleries started to um, explore ways of using that software to show um, art spaces, exhibitions to audiences. Um, so I wanted to sort of exploit the, the commercial yeah. software and to turn it into something where um, to turn it on its head. And it was interesting because it's quite glitchy as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I like that, you know, with the what I've actually done is I've added a skin to it to change the, the look of it and make it black and white. Yeah. But that's quite a glitchy software that doesn't always work. And I like that because it has a feeling of, you know, it's not perfect. Because yeah, yeah. So you yeah. can't, I can't go onto Google and Google Maps and could go down to the observatory and do that stuff. Um, do you know what? There are ways you can link it. Um, yeah. There is, I think there is a Google Street View. Yeah, app. but it won't be as kind of as... You can't click on the different portals, obviously. No. That's really no. cool. That's so, that's so cool. Where, where did the idea kind of start from? Like, um, I got to say, so I, I was excited whenever whenever I have someone to speak to on Space for Live. I always kind of do my research. I look at look look up look up the person and um, and check out their LinkedIn and see if they have a website. Can see what they do before I, I'm coming live to have a talk. And when I went onto your um, I happened to go onto your LinkedIn earlier uh, today, and I saw that image, um, and I instantly assumed it's a picture of uh, Mars. Mm -hmm. So it was it was such a kind of um, an eye opener that we just assume so mm -hmm. much stuff to do with space imagery because um, I, I saw it um, and I was like, oh, I, I, I just and I was like, oh, that's, that's a cool picture of Mars that I haven't seen before. And I just scrolled past it. And then it came up today and I was like, oh, it's a car park. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure a um, lot, lot of people felt like that in the chat. Um, there were some comments about there as well. So that, that's so interesting. But wh where did that kind of start from, like, like taking pictures of just everyday objects um, that link to space in a way? Uh, uh, so I'm not an astrophotographer. Mm -hmm. I'm not an astronomer. I'm an artist. Yeah. And I, I guess that really there's so many wonderful photographs of of space um you know when i was at the observatory last week we saw the northern lights which was amazing um but i've got to say they were pretty disappointing <laughs> because they look great through the camera yeah. and you know everyone with the astronomers were like helen get your camera out you're the only one with a camera tonight so i took these photos and they they looked like you could see the green and pink and it looked amazing but it was like 
okay so in real life it looks muddy but actually on a camera it looks amazing and that's sort of what we do with astro photography so mm. i was like for me it reveals the falseness of um cameras and, and what they show so that's what i wanted to do i wanted to use the construct of the mm. image um to unpick the representation of space or the experience of space so you know the objects are made in the sh sorry the photos of objects are made in a studio the um essentially the, the dark ad adaptation which was shown um the car park that's made in a studio it's, it's a car park but i use yeah. studio lighting and gels and stuff and i was just trying to unpick that feeling of it being a, a constructed environment um, and partly as well, the observatory, uh, sorry, the, the observatory is ho housed in Kilda Forest, which is a man-made forest. So it has this wildness to it, but it's, yeah. it's built. And it, for me, it's like a great metaphor for space. And um, and that's really what I was trying to play with and, and think about. Oh, that's so cool. That's a really interesting project. I'll def definitely be checking that out later on. What's, what's, what's kind of next for you then um, after you wrap up your PhD? What are you looking to do in terms of photography? Link it, are you still going to kind of stay in the space themed I think, environment or i think do you know what i haven't thought that far ahead um yeah. so i've got a while yet because i've still got to write it up and make sense of what it is but yeah. i mean for me what i love about photography and science is this sort of represent the, the research between it um you know i've i studied i did my ma somewhere which was you know quite fine art photography and quite commercial in a sense but I've sort of soon realized I didn't really want to go into that. I wanted to be more about um, uh, almost finding out new ideas and new knowledge through the photos that I make. And science is a really great, great way of doing that. And to be honest, the more photos I make or the, the more work I produce, the more I want to get involved with space and finding out different elements of it and thinking through it. Because there is that wonderful representation and connection between, like I said at the beginning, the dark room and that immersive space of you know being in darkness and being in a dark sky park so yeah. I, I, the more i take the more i make the more questions i have which is yeah. really great because it gives me food for thought later on that's nice that's nice what advice would you have or maybe some uh, younger photographers who are looking to get into photography and might might be looking to do something like yourself do you know what i think stick with things try things out we've all got a camera in our pockets now and i think yeah. that's amazing you know it's like it, it's photography like space is for everybody i feel you know we've all we're all connected to photography we're all in pictures or have been captured by cameras in some way mm -hmm. and we you know most of us have cameras in our pockets now or, or a connection with photography and you know it's democratic like space you know we can all look up generally i mean obviously light pollution is hard and there are certain ways where it's difficult to see space but you know there's a democratic nature of space and also photography that it connects really really well so um i think the passion connects in a nice way and Definitely. just stick to you know just do what you love i mean i've got to where i am through just doing what i love and you know making photos and you know and the the, the, the my relationship with space started when i was a um a, a child with a, a brother who was well into doctor who um and uh, you know so i sort of you know well, it wasn't cool by the way um and um and and so it's always been in there in some in some way um and you know it's almost like this project was meant to happen yeah. um so but yeah just do i think no, it doesn't matter what you do in life but do things that you love and that you care about and if space is what interests you in some way there's always a connection you can have with it even if you're not an astronaut or a scientist you can also be connected with it if you're an artist and a creative person like me. Hundred percent, hundred percent agree with that. I mean, there's so many, there's so much um, in space in the space industry that's not kind of being an engineer or being a being an astronaut. There is, uh, there is so much room for um, an artistic approach, um, a creative approach to so many of the projects we're doing. So um, thank you so much for that. Uh, a huge, huge thank you to everyone who's joined us tonight. Um, we had a we had a very good audience and thank you Rianne, thank you Anthony um thank you the northeast photography network thanks for tuning in um thanks ground based face as ever um and we posted the uh link in the chat to check out um the uh, the pro Helen's project um to check those out uh bookmark them so you can check them out later on as well 
and um, Helen, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Uh, thank you for sharing your journey. Thank you for sharing such a wonderful presentation with so much uh, great photography. Um, it's been great having you on the show. Thank you for having me. It's been lovely to talk about what I do and, and uh, yeah, brilliant. Thank you. No worries. Uh, it's been it's been a pleasure having you. Um, remember, you can catch up uh, with this talk again on YouTube if you're watching this on Facebook. Uh, we're going to be posting out little clips um, across our social medias as well. Uh, so check out those best bits. Uh, thanks again, Rianne, for your great comment. Um, we, we're glad you enjoyed it. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do um, and put a note in the diary for uh, next to next Tuesday when we're going to be back. Um, I think that's the first of March, it might be. Um, but put date in diary because we'll be back again with our next episode on uh, Space Tour Live with the Space Roundup with space experts and astronomers Nick Howes and Terry Mosley, where we bring you the latest and greatest in space. Um, Helen, thank you so much for taking your evening out. I hope everyone stays safe, take care. Um, and look after yourself, especially with um, the storm coming. Have a great evening, um, and we'll see you around. Take care, guys. Hi, uh, my name's Nick Howes, space enthusiast, author, writer, broadcaster. Hi, I'm Terry Mosley, past president of the Irish Astronomical Association, lifelong astronomy and space nerd, absolutely fascinated by everything both man-made and natural up there. So every two weeks, Terry and I give you the latest, hottest news from space and uh, human spaceflight, robotic spaceflight, and what's happening up in the skies. Um, please tune in to us every fortnight uh, with the space stuff. Hi, all.